Okay. Um, this this karakia is um, all about caring for uh, our forests, our ocean, and our atmosphere, and mentions the the Atua, uh, who who um, have charge of those departments, um, Tane, Tangaroa, and Tafirimatea, uh, <clears throat> and also. Uh, gives responsibility to us um, to, to take care of the forests, the ocean, and the atmosphere. atmosphere. Kia hiwa rā e ngā teina o te taiao a ranganui rāua ko papatua nuku. Tia kina te whare nui a tāne ki te koreau Ka kore he whare ora. Tia kina te wai a tangaroa. Ki te kore kwe, ka kore he wai ora. Tia kina te hau a tā firimatea. Ki te kore ia, ka kore he hau ora. Tia kina, tia kina, ti he mauri ora. And over to Chris. Great, thanks very much for that, uh, Joanna. So, um, yeah, so just um, for people who don't know, I'm the sort of convener of the Nature and Climate Group of the, of the Climate Forum. And um, yeah, as Joanna says, really pleased to have um, uh, Barry, Jeremy and Diana here today. I think it's um, this, the, the Tasman Environment Plan is an extremely important it's it's very strategic it's very long term and so i think you know for the climate forum's point of view we're, we're very keen to to get engaged with this this process um i think we made a, an initial submission and the very when you first opened up the um the, the plant was it like some time ago it was about 2020 i think when you when you first started and and um yeah we had some in, initial engagement then and it's really good to see the um, sort of the progress made uh, since then. Um, there's, you know, looking through the the, the website, um, you know, you've got these three um, sort of discussion documents, and 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 I counted them out: thirteen issue and option reports there. So it's um, there's two 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 words that I've I've thought about all of that. One is it's all very impressive. The other thing is it's rather overwhelming as well. To get to to grips with it, and so that's why we thought it would be very useful to to hear directly from um, from the the environment um, plan team about the especially sort of with a climate change focus on on the plan and where you see some of the big issues and and sort of options questions around uh, climate change in in this plan. So. Um, just to, to introduce the, the three people who are here today, um, I've got Barry Johnson, who is the uh, team manager for the environmental plan and responsible for environmental policy with TDC. Um, Jeremy Butler, who's responsible for the transport portfolio uh, for towns, local centers, rural areas and natural landscapes. And Diana Worthy, responsible for natural hazards, climate change and air quality. So that's a really good um, mix there, a good, good selection of, of, of areas that are relevant um, to climate change. And um, so I'll, I'll hand over to you. I think the, the idea is to split this hour more or less 50-50 uh, between the presentation and then some questions, uh, um, so on. So yeah, for about 30 minutes or so for, for a presentation. So thanks very much. Right, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Well, let's just yeah. take one, one thing. If people who have questions, if you could put them in the chat um, for the for the Zoom here, and then we can. Um, I, I've received some questions by email already, but um, we can go with some of the ones from the chat as well. See how it goes. Thanks. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, and yeah, thanks for the opportunity to um, to come and talk to you tonight. So, uh, Jeremy, if you could just share that presentation. Um, We've got, we do have a presentation and you know, we don't want to spend too much time on it so that you do have lots 
chances to opportunities to um, to uh, ask us questions, and we'll endeavour to 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 answer those to the best of our ability um, to cover those. So, um, right, to the next slide, Jeremy. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Page down. Why is it? Why is it not? Hang on, sorry. Oh, I might be on that one there. Sorry, I should have tested this teething problem, shouldn't I? That's technology, isn't it? Yeah, why is it not? Hang on. Okay, let me try something different here. Sorry. I should have tested the... Slide two. Share. Oh, there we go. There we go. It seems to be working. Yep, there we go. <laughs> Didn't do anything yeah. different, but it worked. Okay. Sometimes that's right. I need to turn it off and turn it on again, isn't yep, it? Um, okay, so just a, just a quick overview uh, agenda of, of what we're going to go run through tonight. Um, uh, starting with me, I'll give, and Jeremy will give you a bit of an overview of, of you know, the Tasman Environment Plan, what it is, where it sits, um, in the bigger scheme of things in council business. Um, and then uh, we'll over to Diana to take you through the, the climate change uh, legislative requirements. Um, things are changing quite quickly in, the, in terms of uh, council's obligations, in terms of the law around climate change. Um, Jeremy's going to then talk uh, about mitigation um, and then back to Diana again um, for uh, a discussion and ending the presentation around climate change adaptation. And then on to uh, Q&As. So, Next slide. Yes, just to give you an overview of um, of where the where the plan sits and where we're at. So, I'm in this diagram. Um, so, I'm just to illustrate that you know councils are a a, a creature of statute. Um, you know, on the right hand side there, local government act. That's the, that's council's reason for being. Um, it, it dictates our form, our function, what we do. There's a, a number of strategies and plans that, that councils are required to, to develop and implement under that. Um, councils are also required to implement the Resource Management Act on the left there. Um, and there's a number of strategies and plans under that. So uh, you're probably well aware of the future development strategy that Nelson and Tasman have recently produced. Um, and, what, and we are working on structure plans in different parts of the district at the moment, and most notably Mapur at the moment. Um, but, but in terms of tonight, we're talking about uh, council's functions as a unitary authority around um, our, unit, our regional policy statements and our resource management plans. And um, the, the Tasman Environment Plan will effectively produce one plan that covers uh, the regional policy statement requirements and the resource management plan the requirements currently under the RMA, um, but, but as you're aware, uh, about to change as well. So. Uh, next slide. We currently have the uh, Tasman Regional Policy Statement and Tasman's Resource Management Plan. Um, they were they were developed or first developed um, off the back of the Resource Management Act in 20, uh, 1991. So they're a first generation plan. Um, they are quite dated now. Uh, some parts of the of the plan are reasonably new because the council has been um, doing what's called a rolling review, which is reviewing parts of the plan as it goes forward. Um, but parts of the plan are, are still very old and haven't been touched since they were developed in, in the late 90s or early 2000s. Um, and also there's, there's a bunch of new national policy uh, and national policy direction and law changes that um, the current plan doesn't reflect. So uh, there's a lot of things that that we need to do in terms of reviewing that plan and um, developing the new plan as well. So we're doing that. There's a legal obligation to review resource management plans every 10 years um, because Tasman has been um, working in a rolling review and reviewing parts of the plan then um, that kind of doesn't really fit with it, but there are parts that are certainly well past their use by date. So we're working on that. We'll have that plan. The other thing too is as you develop a new plan, the old plan carries on. So while we will be developing the new plan, um, this plan here, the TRMP, the Blue Book, um, will remain um, active and in the background 
probably for at least another six to 10 years. As, as the new plan's developed and it goes further through the process and gains more weight, then the weight that we give this existing plan will kind of die away. So it's a bit of a balancing act um, as we go through that. So uh, next slide. So um, now what does it all mean given that we've, got, we've now got a new piece of legislation that's just landed last week? Um, we have two new pieces of legislation to replace the RMA, um, the Natural and Built Environments Bill at the moment, a strategic planning bill, and we'll also at some stage have a Climate Adaptation Act or bill as well. So what that will mean is um, the future development strategy that I mentioned before that's joint with, with Nelson City, uh, it will morph into a, a regional spatial strategy. So uh, in my words, it's a, a future development strategy on steroids, um, but at that high speed, strategic level. Um, so in some ways that will be an uh, evolution of what we already have with the future development strategy at the moment. Um, we will still have a plan, a resource management plan, um, but under the new legislation we have to do that combined with, with Nelson. So one plan for the Nelson Tasman region. Um, and certainly uh, the work that we're doing at the moment and the stuff we're consulting on at the moment is, is very relevant because the issues, the environmental issues are always going to be the issues regardless of what the legal framework looks like. And at a, certainly at a high level, the options that, that we have for, for addressing those issues and, and achieving the environmental outcomes that the community wants um, won't change that much. Uh, we might have some more tools in the toolbox or different tools in the toolbox to achieve those outcomes, um, but the outcomes are likely to stay the same. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, we will continue to have and use structure plans as a, as a method um, for the intermediary between what the regional spatial strategy or future development strategy identifies areas for growth and then what is then implemented through the plan. So that's what the new future will look like. A little bit, a little bit the same and a little bit different to, to what we have at the moment, um, but the big one is a combined plan with, uh, with Nelson City. So we're working through that at the moment. So um, as, uh, yeah, as, as Chris touched on uh, just before <clears throat> we started this process, in well in late 2018 actually when we commenced a review of the current plan uh, first thing we did was was assess how well the current plan was working um, and reviewed all the all the sections in it uh, we came up we cut it up into 23 different portfolios actually um, some of those we're consulting on now um, the rest we're consulting on um, the middle of next year uh, but we did that review, the initial review of the of the of the current plan. Parts of it are okay, and and you know they're, they're still fit for purpose. Parts of it, as we know, um, do need fixing, and the review certainly highlighted those areas as well, and it also um, you know highlighted what were the big environmental issues. And that first round of consultation in 2020 was very much around um, from what we what we'd learnt, had checking in with the community, had we got the got the issues right. Were there any other issues that that we'd missed, or any issues that that the community thought we needed to be included in, um, and confirming that? So off the back of that, we got we got a really good response to that first round of, of um, engagement or consultation in 2020, and that's helped inform the work we've done now. So now that we've confirmed what the issues are, we've been working on actually what are the options we've got to actually address those issues and, and, and achieve the, the outcomes that communities want. So that's very much what this round of consultation is about. It's um, checking in. We've identified issues for addressing, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> identified options for addressing these issues, uh, testing those. In some cases, it, it, it's relatively clear, um, you know, what, what the best option is for addressing things and other areas it's not so clear. Um, so it's a little bit of both and and it's really critical. Feedback at this point is very critical um, because what we get now will inform the final advice we give to the council to say, hey, look, this is the policy settings that, that should go in the plan. So the feedback we get now will, will, will basically um, flavour that the final, you know, the final advice and the final decisions the council makes to enable us to start drafting that plan. And we will draft that that big plan, the replacement of the TRMP. And yes, there are a lot of topics. It's very comprehensive. Part of that's because we're a unitary authority. Um, and we'll come back at this stage, 2024, um, with a draft plan um, to test, you know, and then you get to see what the legal wording looks like. And at that stage, that's before we kick into the, the, the kind of official legal process where we've got hearings and formal submissions and all that sort of stuff. So that's where we're at at the moment. Um, Round two, issues and options. So next slide, Jeremy. 
So we, are, we do have three discussion documents um, and, and Diane and Jaren will take you through those. Uh, the first one is, is um, uh, environment and development, very much uh, primarily focused, I guess, on our district council functions. Um, and the, the mountains to the sea is, is touching on some of those more regional council-like functions um, around managing our fresh water and managing our coastal environment. Um, and the towns and villages are an extension of, of the first document, um, which uh, looks at, at the issues uh, for each of our 16 or 17 towns in, um, in Tasman that we go through. So look, that's probably enough for me. I'll hand over to Jeremy now um, to take you through. Was it Diana, sorry? Diana, uh, I think. Oh, no, I, no I, think it's, I think it's me. Um, I'm going to work, uh, work yeah. through these documents. Hey, um, but Barry, I just thought I'd just mention one other aspect that, um, that you may not have, and that just that this um, engagement that we're coming out with that's shown on the slide here. That's about half of the topics. So we will also be coming back in about the middle of next year to bring the other half of the topics. So um, so yeah, what, what, what you see in the discussion documents is about 50% of the, um, the, the sort of the full scope of the TEP. And so we'll um, just to sort of split up the workload really, we'll be coming back with another round in July too, roughly. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm just gonna really briefly take you through the um, uh, the actual um, content of the, the documents um, and, and other webinars uh, and other public events have gone into more detail with this, but I'm just going to keep it really high level because we want to come back towards the end of the presentation and focus on the climate change um, aspects. So the first document we've got is this uh, Managing Tasman's Environment and Development, and this is a set of uh, topics which cover go right across the scope of the TEP, although, as I say, about half of them. Um, and so they're listed there. Um, I'll very quickly just go through and mention them. Um, we, we, as part of the TEP, we have to identify the regionally significant issues, and we're looking at adding um, some additional issues, which I'll come back to shortly. Uh, we look at our stand, outstanding natural features and landscapes, and many of you might have seen the work that we've done on that. It's been quite in-depth work over the last couple of years to identify our landscapes. Uh, in the document, we provide some draft or some concept rules on those. Uh, we look at light uh, aspects to do with um, uh, protecting the night sky, but also um, lot managing light at quite a local level. Uh, we look at signs uh, in terms of our um, urban and our rural environments, uh, and how, how many signs we see about and how we control those. Um, and our urban areas is, is a very important part, and then that's uh, drills down to the, the towns and villages that Barry mentioned. So we, we've gone through uh, well, we've looked at our urban areas as a as a whole in terms of the, the policy and how they function and um, and uh, some of the things we need to do with those urban areas. And for every one of our towns and villages, we've uh, looked at um, uh, what you know what are the really key things we need to do for those urban areas. Uh, notable trees and historic heritage. Uh, we have both trees and heritage buildings protected under the current district plan, uh, and that will transition through to the new plan. And we're looking for uh, nominations uh, on those, um, on both those for additional trees and heritage buildings that we should be protecting. Our rural areas, um, our rural areas have had a bit of attention through Plan Change 60, which some of you may be aware of, which was our rural review a few years back. Uh, but there's still some outstanding areas of, of rural policy, uh, which I'll come back to shortly. A rural three zone is a, uh, a, a an unusual zone um, around the Mapua area um, between Nelson and the Appleby Strait. Uh, sorry, um, Motueka and the Appleby Strait, and uh, that that's uh, there's some significant changes there that I'll mention also. And then our energy and infrastructure are uh, some portfolios we're looking at the policy of, and um, transportation uh, to do with um, not so much council on council roads and council you know um, cycleways and, and public transport and things but more about um, the rules for public transportation and policy um, as it affects businesses and industrial areas uh, and then finally our coastal environment and our coastal natural character uh, um, and again some concept rules on those uh, so um, yeah just um, sorry I'll just jump across here and scroll this down here we go. Okay, so um, yeah, our regional um, significant issues is, is, is one aspect which we're identifying um, that to um, add climate change as a um, regionally significant issue, and that has a flow-on effect of of um, through the plan for a number of other policy aspects. Uh, I mentioned our towns and villages. Um, we've got this uh, very bright slide which um, shows all of the different towns and villages we've got. They are all different. They've all got different character. 
Uh, and um, if you're interested in any particular one of those where you live or that you um, that you um, associate with, uh, then we've got a, a sheet on the issues and the ideas or possible options for the future for each one of those, uh, apart from Pohara and Mapua, um, because that, um, for, for various reasons, mainly um, Pohara needs a bit more work and Mapua's got a structure plan um, that's going on at the moment in quite a bit more detail. So um, we're doing that sort of in detail with the community. Uh, and then the final document is um, the Mountains to the Sea document. And this is, uh, we've got a particular webinar that's uh, on the 23rd of November. So that's coming up. So if you're interested more about uh, this webinar, then uh, tune into that, sorry, into that topic, tune into that webinar. And it's really to do, as Barry said, with identifying a vision and then the values for our freshwater and our coastal environment. And it's really important we identify what our values are, what values people hold for our freshwater and our coastal environment, because that really drives a lot of the, the freshwater um, uh, work stream from there. Uh, so, right, I'll hand over to Diana. I'll be back shortly, uh, but Diana will take you through uh, these aspects. Thanks, Jeremy, and kia ora koutou. It's great to be here this evening. Um, so I'm just going to give a very quick overview in terms of our legislative requirements around climate change. So in terms of the RMA, um, part two, existing responsibilities under section seven, uh, we need to have regard to the effects of climate change and also under section six as a matter of national importance, um, we need to manage the significant risks from natural hazards and obviously one of the effects from climate change will be in relation to natural hazards and the weather related natural hazard events we're going to see them all to be more uh, frequent and more severe. In terms of, I suppose, our national toolbox in relation to national direction, we've also got uh, other guidance there in relation to the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement 2010. Uh, so within the NZCPS, councils are required to identify uh, coastal hazards and also undertake an assessment of hazard risks over at least a hundred year time frame. Um, so that's really important to note in terms of land use planning. We are actually looking at the, those hazard risks and sea level rise over 100 years plus. Um, back in 2017, uh, the government released coastal hazards and climate change guidance for local government. And that sets out a 10 step decision making process for councils to follow in relation to coastal hazards and sea level rise. Um, a lot of you will know that's in terms of, say, that DAP process. Um, so I project lead the coastal management process, which is council's response um, to that. And more recently, in July, um, MFE put out interim guidance in relation to the use of the new sea level rise projections. And some of you will be familiar with the NZ Sea Rise pla um, platform that has those new projections. Okay, so next slide. So come 30th of November, um, the RMA is changing and we're gonna have some extra responsibilities um, in relation to climate change considerations. They're gonna be strengthened. Um, so a provision is coming in that will say that for us, when we're making or amending um, either our regional policy statements or our resource management plans, we now need to have regard to emission reduction plans and national adaptation plans. So both of those documents have come out this year. And Ministry for the Environment is very busily working on some guidance for councils in terms of what does it actually mean to have regard to these documents. And we understand that that guidance is gonna come out at the end of this month as well. Um, the other change to the Act will now require councils to consider climate change effects in relation to discharges to air of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and over the last 18 months, Ministry for the Environment has been working on an, a national policy statement and national environmental standards in relation to industrial process heat. Um, and so they're, they're working on that and we expect to actually see that come out um, early next year, hopefully. So there's, there's changes afoot. Um, and so if we go on to the next slide, obviously the actual RMA reform happening at the moment too. 
and one of the key objectives of that reform was for central government to put climate change considerations at the heart of the new legislation. Um, so one of the objectives there was to better prepare for adopt adapting to climate change and risk from natural hazards and to better mitigate emissions. Um, so Barry's talked about those three new pieces of legislation and we know with the Spatial Planning Act, so that's spatially looking at, you know, where are appropriate areas to, for our communities to grow, thinking about things like managed retreat from either, say, sea level rise or possibly even, say, river flooding. Um, we'll have to identify where are those future locations for our communities to go. Um, and it will be embedded within the Natural and Built Environments Act, which is largely that replacement act for the RMA. And also in relation to the Climate Adaptation Act. And so that will be looking at some of those tricky issues around funding and financing managed retreat. So now I'm going to pass over to Jeremy and he's gonna talk about climate change mitigation. Okay, thanks very much, Lana. Uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna come back to the topics that, uh, that I mentioned just before with a particular focus on the mitigation aspects um, that have, uh, that are uh, the mitigation components of those different topics. Uh, so I'm just going to work my way through the relevant ones, really. And um, yeah, I, I guess just uh, uh, reiterating what Barry said at the start that you know we haven't got all the answers yet, and the purpose of this round of engagement is to really get um, feedback from the public, and particularly uh, groups such as this who have got uh, you know fantastic expertise in these areas uh, about where we should be landing in terms of our policy settings. That's ultimately what we're trying to find out here: is you know is get community feedback on what are what are we getting this right? Are we are we about right or? Um, are there changes we need to make in terms of these policy settings? So if I just start with this infrastructure and energy, uh, the, the key aspect here really, I think, is um, uh, around renewable energy generation. Uh, Diana's mentioned that there's work afoot on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that kind of macro level uh, uh, scene uh, and to do with um, uh, process heat and, and the emissions aspects. And that's a difficult uh, thing for council at, at the current time to deal with. So we need that guidance from, um, so so that's on its way as we understand um, and the tools that Barry mentioned in the toolbox. So really the main thing we're able to focus on is renewable energy generation. Uh, we are um, under section seven, I think of the act, we have to have particular regard to renewable energy generation. And uh, we, uh, um, it's an area that we're looking at in terms of supporting it in a number of aspects. It does, so I guess at the top of the south, our main resources are probably solar uh, and possibly to some extent wind. We do have um, some challenges that we run into with uh, wind generation in relation to our outstanding landscapes. So some of the landscapes we're working in, it's probably not appropriate to have uh, large scale wind farms uh, because of those outstanding landscapes. So there is potentially a bit of a clash there. Uh, we, uh, we are starting to see some applications coming through for um, kind of utility scale uh, um, solar generation um, but the other aspect we've got there is around uh, productive land so we've got strong direction now about productive land so we're just sort of having to um, uh, work, walk that tightrope between protecting productive land but enabling aspects such as uh, solar generation at a utility scale um, happy to answer any questions about that but again that's a, an area of, of policy work that um, that we're developing uh, moving on to transport uh, so this is an area um, now, yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, just recognising that council as a whole is doing a lot of work in this area. We've recently uh, developed and adopted uh, the walking and cycling strategy. Our council's doing a lot of work and, and there's a new uh, um, public transport system uh, that's to be rolled out next year. And I, I understand that's to be using fully electric buses. So there's a lot of work going on by broader council. So again, this is just focusing in on the, the, the I guess, um, resource management uh, aspects. Um, one of the areas we're looking at is adopting low traffic neighbourhoods, and I, this is a, a kind of a town planning tool which uh, looks at trying to create neighbourhoods that are, are very um, desirable for walking and cycling and that uh, vehicle traffic is directed around them and not through them, so it's often uh, supporting accessibility and permeability between uh, neighbourhoods through to other neighbourhoods, but not allowing so much in the way of vehicle transport, and that's really to incentivise the walking and cycling connectivity within our urban and environments. Uh, we um, a, a general overall policy approach of supporting 
uh, electric vehicle uh, charging and the electrification of the vehicle, the transportation system as a whole. Uh, there's really, there's actually very few impediments to that at the moment. Our rules are quite uh, permissive when it comes to some of that key infrastructure. Uh, and then um, yeah, there's aspects to do with workplace travel and supporting the ability of people to walk and cycle. And that could be providing some, as simple as making sure there's enough bike parks, making sure that there's um, a shower and lockers and that kind of thing. So a lot of that sort of stuff just to really uh, make it easy. The bike, if, the, um, if the cycleways are there, uh, if the, um, the, 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 the bikes are accessible and people have got somewhere to take a shower, then you know, all that adds up to a much more um, likelihood that people will use those, um, those options. Okay, so yeah, just moving on to our rural areas and our rural three zone. Now these sort of go together. So uh, 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 approach one of the key issues that's come through with the rural areas is that we do have we we've got what's called rural residential zones, and some of you may be aware of them. Some of you might even be living in them. Uh, that they are sort of spot zones around some of the more rural areas and they do have let's call them lifestyle blocks, um, and that could be a range of different forms though, and. Um, and often they are very car dominated and we have got good evidence that they do cause quite a high level of emissions per capita. So they do cause significant numbers of vehicle movements. Um, on one hand, supporting rural communities is arguably a good thing. Uh, and, and we've had calls for, to, for more people to live in some of these rural residential areas, but uh, the evidence that we've got is that that would, by, by enabling more people to live in these rural residential areas, it would cause a significant increase in emissions, uh, everything else being equal. So um, that's something we just need to look at very, very carefully. And we're asking for feedback on that. Uh, with um, you know potential for either status quo, uh, reducing uh, the, the ability of people to live in these uh, rural residential locations, or on the other hand, increasing it. Uh, but there's, there's pros and cons each way. And um, some of you may be interested in the rural three zone. That's a particular area that oh, it's shown on the on the left there, actually, just with the snip of the um, of, of the, the document there. And uh, that's a, a quite a significant area of land which currently enables quite a lot of development. And for a range of historical reasons, that has primarily been developing in a rural residential style. And when I say that, I mean kind of large lots um, because they need their on-site wastewater system. Um, a, lo a lot of lawn mowers, a lot of lawns and mm -hmm. um, quite quite expensive. Um, sort of style of development, and that's really not what was intended. If we go, if we go back to the original planning, it just wasn't intended to um, to, to produce that product, and it's for a range of reasons that it is now. So the proposal there is to actually um, uh, close that zone and not and basically discontinue the rural three as we know it at the moment, and instead utilise that or, or really save that land as a resilient elevated. Uh, location that's free from sea level rise for um, for future retreat potentially um, uh, as an option, just because it's uh, yeah it, the the emissions and the style of land use is not really what we're after, um, given the guidance that Diana's just taking you through. Um, our urban areas are again some broad policies that support compact form. We are uh, we heard very clearly through the future development strategy um, that that, um, that people put a lot of importance on growing up, not out. Uh, to accommodate our growth, you know, there will need to be some greenfield development, uh, but that needs to be in appropriate locations. The um, National Policy Statement for Urban Development seeks that we keep a, um, a well-functioning urban uh, environment, it's called, I think. Um, so keeping that density, uh, but also wherever possible, supporting housing intensification. And we're really working on that, in a num particularly in Richmond right at the moment, but we'll be also extending that work out to Brightwater, Wakefield, um, uh, uh, Motueka, uh, and potentially Tarkika as well. So yeah, utilizing medium density residential zone, which will really support and, and, and ramp up that, um, that eff those efforts around intensification. Uh, and of course that feeds into promoting the use of trans walk, uh, public transport, walking, cycling, uh, and active connections and green spaces. So yeah, really just working on our urban environment uh, with those sort of outcomes. Okay, so that's really a, a, a lightning tour through the, um, the mitigation um, highlights that, that are coming out of the, the, um, the documents as they stand at the moment. Diana. Okay, so now I'll talk about the other side of the climate change coin in terms of adaptation. Oh, sorry, it's me. 
Um, so in the main discussion document under the topics of transport, infrastructure and energy, historic heritage and notable trees, uh, we recognise that these are vulnerable to both natural hazards and the effects of climate change. Um, so in terms of the response there, particularly in relation to infrastructure, um, promoting resilience um, to natural hazards and climate change, one of the key projects that I'm working on is that coastal management project. Um, and so we'll be working through that over the coming years. Um, I just want to point out in relation to historic heritage, particularly sites and areas of significance to iwi and Māori through the National Adaptation Plan, government has single, signaled that they're going to provide a lot of funding to work uh, with iwi and Māori around identifying the risks to their taonga um, and options to how they can respond, very much recognising climate change. So we'll go on to the next slide. And in terms of our discussion documents, um, thinking about resilient communities, so particular with the urban areas and the towns and villages, um, looking at in terms of where we want to um, intensify or do greenfield development, making sure that those sites are resilient to natural hazards and climate change. Um, so we know that through the FDS process, we looked at climate change and natural hazards a lot. Um, and we know we've already identified, I suppose, those key strategic areas of housing and business growth over the next 30 years. But in addition to that, through this TEP process, we also need to look at, I suppose, more of those smaller sites and local nuances um, and make sure that they're resilient as well through that rezoning process. And in terms of coastal management and thinking about coastal hazards and climate change, um, we're signaling in our coastal communities and the towns and villages documents that we will be coming out to the community middle of next year as part of that second tranche of work. Um, and we'll be doing work looking in terms of basically, I suppose, as a first step, making sure that um, we don't intensify in these coastal communities and essentially make the situation worse. We don't want more people, more uh, development in these areas that we know are going to be affected by sea level rise over the longer term. So we've listed on that slide some of the potential options that we can look at doing um, in terms of yeah, slowing down uh, that development yeah. and through the engagement work I did last year with the coastal management project, and we talked about uh, the four options, um, it's avoidance strategy. So we're looking to roll out that process next year. And we also have some targeted questions in relation to our towns and villages, where we feel that at this point, we can start to, to have that discussion with the community. So for the Collingwood one, um, recognising that the, the short coastal plain where Collingwood's uh, CBD is located will be affected by sea level rise over the longer term. So we've posed, I suppose, a question there asking for feedback around what does the community think about gradually moving the town centre to higher ground and something that was signalled through the FDS as well. For Maraho, again, it's a low-lying coastal community, and we recognise that based on the framework of the existing legislation that we have, um, that we don't, we shouldn't be providing for significant future growth in that area beyond what's currently, I suppose, available zoned within the plan, um, and what are people's thoughts and ideas around options for the future of Maraho. And then also Jeremy touched on in terms of that rural three zone. Um, we that area um, does provide a resilient long-term housing opportunity for when our coastal communities need to retreat. So we're asking a question around that. Um, but certainly um, there's quite a bit more work to be done in that space um, for climate change adaptation and that will be coming through the natural hazards portfolio um, and that second round of engagement in July next year. So I think that sums up um, our presentation um, and we're ready for questions and we're happy to give some answers. But I just want to reiterate that all this information that we've talked about tonight, um, it's on our website. You can see there on the Shape Tasman website, that's a, a new portal for engagements. And so we've got 
quite a large um, environment plan pages there with all the documents. Um, there's lots to read. And if you have any questions, um, you can email us on the environment plan email address, which is also on that slide. Okay, over Great. to you. Thanks very much indeed, um, Diana, Jeremy, Barry. That's very, very, very well organized presentation. Thank, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, I think that um, gives us the the sort of the, the guidance and, and the overview to structure some, some response. So that's that, that was very helpful. Yeah. Um, if we could stop the screen sharing, could, sure. uh, this, um, then yeah, there we are. That's great. So some some questions here. I, I have one one question up up front. Uh, one one once um what the, the time frame for this plan at sometimes you you've talked about 30 years and other things for a hundred years. So what's the there's like the planning horizon that you're looking at for, for this environment plan? Yeah, sometimes it is, sometimes it is 30 years <laughs> um, for, for housing growth. Um, you know, through the future development strategy, we we're required to look out 30 years. Um, you know, if you're dealing with climate change, you're dealing with 100 years. Um, the plan itself um, has to be reviewed every 10 years. Mm. So while we're planning for that long term, um, medium to long term, the actual review of the plan uh, means that it's it's kept relatively up to date um, by their nature and because of the, the processes is quite cumbersome and quite involved that you know plans don't tend to be particularly responsive to, to emerging issues. And and you see it with our current plan, you know, when when the current plan was produced, climate change wasn't even on the radar particularly in terms of the impacts and, and you know the, the tropical cyclones we've had since it was produced. So uh, yeah, the, the, the horizons are, are relatively long, but the time the, the plan review process is kind of every 10 years. So hopefully that sheds a bit of light on it for you, Chris. Right, well, one other sort of strategic level question here that's come up is, how do you envisage working with Nelson City Council to develop the joint plan? So are they sort of working on a similar plan or they've already got one, right? So how do they, how, how does this mesh together? Yeah, yeah, really good, really good question. Um, we're working on that. So even without the new legislation, we are looking to uh, looking to the future. And it's at some levels, it's inevitable the government's going to combine our two councils at some stage. So we mm -hmm. had been looking that way. But under the new legislation, there will be a there has to be a combined planning committee that has equal representation from or a minimum of two reps from each council um, and a number of EWI reps and a government appointee. And that will be its own independent statutory body independent of the councils but it'll develop the plan on behalf of the two councils and iwi so um the devil will be in the detail we don't know how we're gonna how we're going to um move from where we are now into the new system and that's not clear from the from the draft legislation or the bill we've seen so far and that's the thing um nelson's got a draft plan that's pretty much ready to go it's getting older it's getting out of date by the day we're about two years behind and we're playing catch up to get to the same point where we can kind of join the two together but um there's this big unknown in the middle as well <laughs> in terms of you know where the legislation's going to land but yeah, the thing yeah. i would add too is that staff work closely together between the two councils particularly on a lot of our technical work so i work closely with the natural hazards planners over there um there's also yeah alignment with other work so like our freshwater team working together hmm. Okay, right. Another question from Joanna here, who's impressed by the long term thinking in terms of reserving areas for managed retreat. Uh, do you have a longer frame than 30 years for how much of Tasman can be allowed for human use and how much kept for nature? Yeah, or well, maybe I could have a go there. Um, well, just following on, I guess, from what Barry said. Um, Yes, we do. We are looking at more than 30 years um, because we have to on, on some of these aspects. Um, but projecting our growth that far ahead, I think what I, what I talked about with the rural three zone, just for example, it's it's really a precautionary thing. You know, we, we really haven't got that much uh, foresight as to what, what it's going to look like in, you know, 50, 80, 100 years. But we do know that there's some aspects such as sea level rise are going to be with us for, for you know, generations, of course. So, um, I guess the the position that we've taken there is is a precautionary position, but we think it's a um, it's appropriate in terms of how much is left for nature. Um, yeah, hard, hard to answer that directly. One thing we are very cognizant of, though, with our retreating sea level, is that we um, we must allow. Uh, 
the coastal margin to migrate. Uh, and that, in fact, there was um, the piece of work for Richmond West, uh, which some people may remember a few years ago, and it was actually built into that as well, um, that, 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 that any building against the coast should needs to be um, uh, conservative and that it needs to be far enough set back to enable that, uh, tra that transition and that migration of the coastal margin so that the coastal margin is, doesn't become squeezed between a rising sea and hard human development. So, you know, we are, we are giving thought to all of these things. Um, to some extent, nature will have to move. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we just have to try and move around it. Mm. I'd add to that too, the new legislation um, around regional spatial strategies um, puts a stronger emphasis on councils identifying go and no-go areas. Um, so councils will be forced to identify those, I guess, those no-go areas as well as the, the growth areas, areas for growth. So um, that will evolve as we as we get our heads around what that will actually mean. But um, my initial take on it, very initial take, is that you know councils are going to have to be a lot clearer um, and a lot more strategic about um, where those where those growth areas are, but also where those no go areas are. So hopefully, it'll also give councils more teeth and um, more more ability to be uh, a bit more forceful in that space. Um, under the RMA, it's very hard to do those sorts of things. And one, one more aspect I'll just throw in there would be um, we're expecting a natural pol uh, natural a um, national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity, and I think the last uh, draft had a requirement for ten percent uh, indigenous vegetation cover in our urban areas. So, uh, assuming that that survives its way through to the finished product, which will likely come out in twenty twenty three, yeah, there could be that requirement for ten percent indigenous uh, indigenous vegetation. Uh, in our urban areas, so you know that's that, you know there there is work going on, I guess, to green some of our environments. Right. Thanks. Yeah, th this concept of of no go areas that's that's really interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. No, that that's there's food for thought around that. Um, another question: Can you put wind farms into productive pine forests? <laughs> Place. Yeah. Good um, question. Yeah. Probably, yeah. <laughs> no reason why not. Uh, what I guess I was getting at with wind farms is, and I, and I know this isn't what the question was about, but um, we've been through a big project uh, uh, of identifying our outstanding natural landscapes, uh, and that's been something that's been required under the RMA and is also required under the NBA going forward to identify outstanding landscapes and to protect them from inappropriate use. And in a lot of cases, we would have to deem that wind farms would be inappropriate on outstanding landscapes. Um, generally speaking, pine forests won't be in outstanding landscape areas mm. because of the, the nature of their land use. So um, in those locations, wind farms may well be more permissive. It's it's just often they're not windy enough. <laughs> it's usually the big hilly um, remote areas which are the windy ones. So I guess it's in places around Wellington where you've got... Um, You've got the, the the happy combination of windy areas on relatively modified landscapes. Okay, and, and well, question for me now on, on on renewables. So you, what you were talking about with solar was basically at sort of the utility level. But what about household level solar, and what can you do to to encourage that and in sort of urban environments because that would greatly increase resilience as well. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we we have done a couple of wee tweaks recently, which uh, take away. A height controls uh, or, or height limitations on properties to enable solar panels. So if your solar panel needs to stick up on an angle, then um, you don't, you're not penalized from a height point of view. So that's just a very small thing. Uh, apart from that, I mean, we don't put any particular, so we as a planning team and, and the district plan doesn't put any constraints on uh, household level solar, I don't think, unless anyone can correct me. Um, so yeah, really it's going to come down to the, the price signals and the economics of it. Um, mm. Uh, is there any way to incentivize it? In, well, in the yeah, planning? well, yeah. <laughs> uh, in planning uh, or, regu really. or regulatory or um, regulatory. Well, then you yeah. start to get into Building Act territory, you know. And yeah. I guess there's nothing stopping um, the Building Act from requiring it. And I and I imagine that might be what you're what you're driving at. Um, but you know that's outside our control. Yeah. But yeah. I know I know people do talk about you know that the the, the building code needs to look at things like well already does double glazing, but you know better insulation, mm. uh, um, uh, renewable generation. There's a lot of things that could be added into the building code, um, but past that, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> yeah, so I was just going to add that MB actually has a work program that's called Building for Climate Change, and they are looking into things like, as Jeremy said, insulation, 
and whatnot. Um, I think for us, our role as planners is just to make sure that the planning framework is enabling um, and there'll be other tools. It would be good to see central government providing subsidies in this space. Um, I lived in the UK for years and yeah, lots of people were putting panels on their roofs, but and it was made possible because of the subsidies. Yeah. I guess yeah. from a planning perspective, the one thing you need to be careful about um, that nexus between intensification of, of housing and shading of your next door neighbor's solar panels. So there need to be ways that you can mitigate against that if somebody's invested ten thousand dollars in solar panels and then their neighbor puts up a three-story building. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yep. Okay. Um, right. Other questions. These ones that were sent to me um, earlier by by Alison. Um, what about stranded assets as sea levels rise? What what happens there? Yeah, good question, to be honest. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking at the new legislation, particularly the Climate Adaptation Act, um, to be providing guidance around the funding and financing um, of managed retreat. Um, but in the future, it's, it is going to be a significant issue. Do, do you see, I mean, looking at the 100 year time horizon for climate change, all, all these developments, um, Along sort of Lower Queen Street and and those sort of new commercial areas that are coming up on the, you know, on, on the coastal side of that, is that do, do you do you don't see problems with that down the road? Um, yeah, certainly in terms of existing development on Lower Queen Street on on the coastal side of Lower Queen Street, I might emphasise, you know, the um, all the new housing development that's going in in Berryfields and Richmond West, um, it's. It looks like it's low lying, but it's actually not. It's actually, you know, the elevation is high. It's it's outside a two meter sea level rise. Um, but yeah, certainly there are, you know, lots of areas in our district that are low lying existing development. And nationally, this is going to, you know, be a problem for all of us. Um, how how do we uh, respond to that? Yeah, just to add to that. Um... We are seeing in that industrial area resource consents that are with a, that are time limited, mm -hmm. um, and with conditions that um, when the resource consent expires, the buildings will have to be removed. Mm. So um, there is consideration with some of the new development that's going in there, especially in the lower the lower areas that um, just for that you know for that specific thing around stranded assets, so that when it gets to the end of its life or the sea rises to the point where it's you know it can't be used anymore, then 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 the user has to remove it and the community is not left to pick up the bill for removing it. So um, we are seeing our consent team doing some innovative stuff like that. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, I say what's to stop someone from going, saying, declaring bankruptcy and then they never do it. Mm. You know, it, it, should you pay a bond up front to cover that cost down the road as a I don't know. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's yeah. irrelevant, and I think it's yeah, relevant. It's, I think I think these will be some of the tools, and I think yeah. what Diana was getting at before is that there's with the tools we've got at the moment, there's only a certain amount we can do, and we're doing the best yeah. we can, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, not 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 making apologies or anything. And when that um, climate adaptation bill comes forward, we'd expect a lot more tools in our toolbox mm -hmm. around managed retreat. You know, a lot of the stuff we're talking about at the moment is what you're seeing around the country is unmanaged retreat. It's you know, <laughs> we have to go. And this is really moving towards a, a much more proactive, let's come up with a plan and work out a way the way we can actually retreat in a managed way. And yes, you know, to get technical, there's things like section nine, which is existing use rights. At the moment, we actually can't make people move. Um, that that's that under the NBA that's changing uh, and there will be additional tools that we've got to actually um, be more proactive about the, the, um, the retreat. Okay, that's great. One one other um, question about, and I know you're sort of the biodiversity part doesn't come in till middle of next year, right? But a question about wilding pine removal, sort of how important that is, and making sure that that's sort of included within within the plan, and, and the main, not just removal of of affected areas, but ones that have already been cleaned, that the maintenance is is maintained, so it doesn't doesn't creep back again. So. Yeah, that's um, that's really topical at the moment with um, the government reviewing the regulations. So there's national regulations around deforestation, and the government is proposing to um, allow carbon forests the same regulatory framework. 
and especially if we're going to get carbon forests, permanent forests out of out of exotic species, the big concern that Tasman has and has submitted on to the government on it is how do you manage wildings and particularly you know wildings outside the property as well. So they're really live issues at the moment, and we've been we're. Um, Hopefully, we'd like to see a bit more thought come from central government. If they're going to regulate the stuff, then they need to be across the the the, the you know the cross boundary effects and the, the effects of, of wildings from people who are doing this. Oh, that's that's great that you guys are already already onto that. So that's yeah, that's that's really good. Um, right, and and any more questions from anyone? Did, Joanna, did you have something? Uh, yeah, just a small question. Uh, to do with infrastructure, any any thought about um, ab ab absorbent surfaces, absorbent to stormwater in um, settlement areas? Mm. Yeah, it's um, something that our um, so, so we've in our current plan we've got a concept of low impact stormwater design, and we um, we're looking to really expand on that, and 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 the concept being that. Um, to uh, you know, to, to 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 look at the whole of our catchments and how stormwater is integrated into our catchments. So um, there was a plan change done well, a wee while back now, a few years ago, um, which uh, enabled a lot more of that work to happen. Um, to have stormwater detention in catchments and uh, and to really support the. Um, reintegration of stormwater back into the ground surface rather than running it all off in big pipes. Um, and yeah, I think we're looking at taking that further um, uh, through this plan. It's 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 something, I mean, we again, we can only provide a planning framework for it. It's really up to the engineers and uh, what, I guess I'd say our, um, what's called our land development manual. So we share a land development manual with Nelson uh, City Council, and that's really the rule book on what you can build. So it's um, it's about how you design your streets, how you design your cycleways, how you what size pipes to put in, all that real kind of technical stuff. And the 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 plan that we write will ultimately flow into that design manual. So if we're really supporting this low impact design and integrating stormwater into uh, at a catchment level, then that can flow through in some of the designs. Uh, that the engineers use and so when you get a subdivision built or you get urban regeneration they can be looking at some of it but well, well, they, they need to be looking at those sort of designs so yeah that's a, it's a more detailed design solution great what well, one more final question um are the, the topics all these these 13 sort of issues um option is what, what yeah discussion not the discussion ones the issues and option ones are, there, are those ranked in in order of importance what, or no, 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 no um, board. It's just how they came out of my keyboard. <laughs> right. Okay. In fact, they're actually in a pretty random order now. I look at them. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's I not alphabetical. Have... Yeah, so no, yeah, yeah. No, I probably could have grouped them better. It was, um, yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Um, now, I've got one sort of process um, issue here that we're that we're planning to to put in a, a, a submission. And we, we might not make the actual deadline of 12th of December, but I think you're going to be a bit flexible around that. So that's yeah. that's great. One other thought that we've we've had is that we would really appreciate um, more engagement next year, um, sort of sort of some more structured and targeted meetings, maybe face to face if possible or over Zoom. On, on specific topics like sort of energy or transport or, or you know, some of these issues it would be good for some of our people to 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 sort of engage more in more in depth with with people in your team so would, would, would that be a possible way that we could um in a sense we, we wouldn't have to get such a, a detailed um and lengthy submission ready now because we know that we'd have opportunities um through next year to be able to have have more engagement on on a more structured way yeah, I think some of the topics we will be, we, we are going to use um, working groups, stakeholder working groups, so to speak. Um, so certainly in your, in your submission, you can indicate who's interested in what from the climate forum that will help us. Um, understandably, we can't do that with all the topics, given the time we have available um, and, and, the, and the scale of the of the task, we're not a huge team, but but what would be helpful for us um, is, you know, if, if you've got uh, members who are interested in specific areas, then then let us know. And if we're going, if we're using that that method for for various topics, then then we know and we can we can give you a call and get you involved. Yeah, 
that would be great yeah because i think it it's going to be difficult for us to get in you know all all the everything that we would love to put into a submission if we try and do it there's no way you know that we're going to make it with within not before christmas say so so if if we can keep our, our submission now at a relatively high level and then knowing that we there's some opportunities for more detailed work on on particular topics next next year that that would be uh, like the best way forward from from our perspective yeah uh, uh, i mean correct me if i'm wrong uh, barry uh, in terms of the timeline but so so where we're moving to from here is that we will be um once we take this feedback and we and we work you know, we look at this in detail, and then we start to look uh, towards getting instructions from uh, councillors about drafting. So, you know, what uh, we call them drafting instructions, and that's actually, you know, what are we actually going to write? So, and that'll really be progressing through a lot of 2023. So, mm -hmm. you know, where we've got people with specialist interest, there's actually no reason why we can't be continuing. We've got certain people working mm -hmm. on certain portfolios. Um, in fact, if you take the the energy and infrastructure one, we've got a, a, a we've actually got a consultant working on that, um, but a very experienced consultant, and he's really excellent. Um, so yeah, there's no reason why he can't through 2023 he can't be uh, ha having to and fro and bouncing mm -hmm. ideas off people who know what they're talking about. So yeah, yeah. I, I think it, we've called it a sort of a soft closing. But in actual fact, I think for some in some regards, it's a very soft clothing, cl clothing, closing, closing, <laughs> closing, and 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 that discussion can go on to help us draft as we go through next year. That, yeah. that's, that's great. Yeah, uh, that that would be really helpful. I think. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, back to you, Joanna. Then I think. Uh, after adding to Chris's thanks to uh, the TDC people, uh, adding my thanks very much, uh, I'll close with a karakia, which the imagery is that we've been paddling our waka together and breathing together, and we've come to the shore and have landed, and uh, we're expressing gratitude. Ko te ha, ko te po, ko tangaroa, ko te mana, ko te kotahitanga, o namatawaka, homie, huie, tai te. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if, if those from the forum want to stay on for a few more minutes, we'll just have a little discussion internally about the, the submission and how we'll, we'll work on that. Okay. So, all right. Thank Thanks. you. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.